Well, hello and welcome to St. Paul's Church. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're glad that you're joining us for this online worship service. We are in the midst of a message series that we're calling Beyond Hurt. Beyond Hurt, where we're investigating in the Bible where God is calling us to a greater sense of community, a greater sense of oneness and community with Him. And that happens sometimes when we have to move beyond the things that hurt us most. Today's message is titled, When I Hurt Someone Else. And this powerful message will hopefully speak to you wherever you are today. If, as you are joining us for this online worship service, we hope that you'll join us on our website as well at stpauls.faith. You can get there by just following the QR code below me, or you can go to our website, stpauls.faith, and click the Connect With Us button. This is where you can share any contact with information that you're willing to share with us. You can also submit a prayer request. We'd love to be able to pray for you this week. God is doing amazing things as we move closer to the season of Advent, as we prepare our hearts for His arrival. We'd love to know how we can pray for you this week. Well, as we do every week, we also want to say thank you to those of you who continue to partner with us in ministry through your tithes and offerings. It's through your gifts that we're able to do what we do here at St. Paul's, where we say that we're a light for Elizabethtown and beyond. So thank you for all that you do and for all that you're able to do in this amazing season that we're living in. If you'd like to learn more about how to give to St. Paul's, you can once again go to our website at stpauls.faith and click the Give button. We'd love to be able to tell you about online giving or where you can send a tithe check through the mail. For all that you're able to do, we say thank you. And would you join me now for a moment of prayer as we prepare our hearts for worship? And gracious God, we thank you for this day and for all that you do and for everything that you're about to do. We ask, Lord, now that you take these gifts that we're able to return and multiply them several times over as your work here on earth through your church continues. These saints, we pray in your name. Amen. Well, it's about that time, friends. Let's go in for a time of worship.
Hey, church family, it's us again. Uh, we came to you a couple weeks ago and we asked you for a favor. And that favor was to ensure that kids in our community and kids around the world had a Merry Christmas. Well, as you can see in front of us, y'all showed up and we greatly appreciate that. This is just a, a sample of all the gifts that are going to be given out to kids all over the world. And we thank God so much for your commitment to the ministries here at St. Paul's. And we thank God for blessing us with people like you that are generous. Uh, and again, I just want you to look at this stuff and remember yourself, what it was like to open a gift on Christmas morning, uh, that special gift that you just really, really, really wanted. That's what it's going to be like for a kid that may have never experienced that before. So absolutely amazing. Thank you. And uh, we just want to pray for this, these items here as they go out to different places in the world. So if you'd pray with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gifts that you've given us, for putting people here that are, are willing to make sure our kids have a Merry Christmas. We thank you for that blessing, Lord. And we pray for each and every item here that it makes it to its destination and that it just fills the, 
the kid that gets it with, with your joy, Lord, and it lets them know that they're loved by a love that is so much greater than anything we could comprehend. And once again, Lord, we thank you for all of this blessing right here. To your most holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you once again, St. Paul's. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Well, for seven weeks now, we have been in, invited to look into a message series that we've been presenting here at St. Paul's, both here in person and online, called Beyond Hurt. And as the image shows in this graphic, we are looking to the Word of God to see what guidance we can gain as we work through the things 
that hurt us and as we try to navigate when we ourselves hurt others. These messages have indeed showed us the perfect illustration that God's word gives not only on the direction, but how we can also move together as a community. I wonder, as we've been looking at this message series, a question that's come to mind. I, I, I really wonder, what, what would it look like if in, instead of lashing out and yelling past one another as we're off to do in our culture today, what would it look like if we sought to bring hope and love to those around us? In our Beyond Hurt message series, we've examined many different aspects and perspectives of pain and suffering, persecution and rejection. We've seen time and again that God's word shows us what forgiveness, restoration, reunification look like. And they don't come through anything that we can do on our own. No, no. They come through the grace of and peace of Jesus Christ. By the way, a grace and peace that we should be seeking daily. While it may be difficult to extend grace to others, particularly those that seem to go out of their way to, re- to hurt us, and that really, really, really hurts us the most. We also have to think of times when, in fact, it's hard for us to forgive ourselves. Today's uh, message title is, When I Hurt Someone Else. And when I was tapped on the shoulder last week uh, by David Wolverton to, to prepare this message, I thought, oh, good, a message I need to hear. Because, see, for some in the room like me today, we know what it's like. We know the feeling that we, when we come to the realization that through uh, something that we've done unintentionally or something that we've done intentionally, we have hurt someone else. In fact, there may be someone watching online today or sitting in the room who just recently let their emotions get the best of them and as words shot out of their mouth, anger overboiling and clouding their judgment, they might have even felt good about how poorly they made someone else feel. Today, I want us to look into into a couple of questions. What is happening when we hurt others? And what does our lashing out at another person say about our witness for Christ? As those questions dwell here, let us take a moment and just pray together to prepare our hearts for worship. Gracious God, we know that you can do anything. And we pray right now that as your spirit fills this room, Lord, may it make room in our hearts for the message that you would have us here today. Lord, clear the traffic out of the way. Silence the noise as we seek to be with you. These things we pray in your name, amen. So I can remember being in my early 20s. I think I was probably like 22, 23, you know, young, too young to, to know any better, but certainly old enough to know better. You know what I'm saying? I was driving down a really busy street in West Wichita, Kansas called Central Avenue. It was a five lane uh, road with two lanes going each direction and a big turn lane in the middle. This street was busy all the time. And um, I, I can remember driving down this road often while running errands. Another thing you need to know about me at this time is I was always, always in a hurry. It didn't matter where I was going or what I was doing. I was always driving quickly to get there. It didn't matter if I was driving to work at the middle school or driving home after teaching or if I was going to the grocery store or to band practice or to drop off a letter at the post office. I was always driving fast because I was in a hurry. So there I was on this day in my early 20s driving down Central Avenue, probably driving about nine miles over the speed limit because they never pull you over for just nine over. Driving down the, in, the, in the passing lane like I owned it, okay? And then out of nowhere, 
out of nowhere, this big red sedan pulls out of a gas station real nice and slow, makes a right turn, but takes every lane with it and ends up in the left lane right in front of me. It happened so fast, I had to react. I slammed on my brakes to avoid a collision. And I said, the first thing that came to my mind was, come on, grandma. Because only grandmas drive big red cars. (laughs) And drive slowly. (laughs) It's not true. Well, after turning in front of me and, um, you know, orienting, orienting themselves, this person driving this red car ultimately moved over to the right lane. And because I was in the left lane, I sped up to pass them. And, you know, I wasn't going to let this pass. I was going to give them a look as I drove by, you know, give them one of these glares <laughs> to let them know that they'd really ticked me off. Well, as I drove up beside this big red car and was getting ready to, I was getting ready to scowl, you know, my face just intuitively lightened and turned to a smile because driving that car was, in fact, my grandma. <laughs> 100% true story. You can't make this up. When she saw me, she waved, (laughs) and I waved back, (laughs) and my grandma Jessie, my grandma Jessie Skellen went on her way, and I went mine, and I can remember looking in the rearview mirror. I could only see, you know, about this much of my face when I looked at myself, and I thought, oh my, I don't want to be that angry, reactionary person anymore while I'm driving. It was just a moment where I felt like something different has to change. I've told this story for nearly 20 years, and what I love about the story is that it's about my my grandma, Jessie, one of my most favorite people. Um, She went home to be with Jesus a few years ago, but today I get to share her life with you and uh, a couple of hundred other people as part of this message today. And that brings me great joy. Um, I also uh, love telling that story because it's an illustration, really, of two perspectives, that we can look at each other and see a clear difference. One perspective of sort of like this petulant adolescent anger, you know, that's just explosive and reactive. And the other perspective of love. You see, when we hurt other people, our default is this reactionary, unbridled anger, and we're not operating often from a place of love. We're not operating from a place of of kindness. We're operating from really a place of anything but those two things. And a principle that we've heard time and again from our senior pastor, David Wolverton, is that hurt people hurt people. When we are passively or actively hurting others, it's very likely that we're operating also from a place where we're trying to avoid some kind of pain or unsettled nonsense in our lives, or worse, we're trying to navigate it alone. And we don't know what to do. And so we're just all the time. You know what I'm saying? Maybe for some today that's, that's hitting a little too close for home, but there is resurrection even in this. Last week, during a really beautiful and powerful message that Becky Rupp shared with us, um, when we were in the other sanctuary for the traditional service, she referenced the stained glass windows that are, that are in the room. And if you've not ever seen our stained glass windows in our other sanctuary, I invite you at some point to go, sometime to go take a look at them. On one side are the stories of the Old Testament, and on the other are stories from the New. And uh, <laughs> what's really interesting is if you look close enough, you're going to see some amazing detail in their depiction in these stained glass representations. The one that is closest to the door on one side is the the story of David, and it depicts David and Goliath's severed head. No, it's true. Like sometime, go check a look. It's really kind of crazy. It was one of my children's favorite stories. And I'll leave it up to you to determine which one picked out the severed head first. On that same side up front um, is the story of Joseph. Joseph, 
Um, and in this particular depiction, it has the story where it, it begins as he's sold into slavery by his brothers. And at the top, he's the king of Egypt. What a remarkable story. And one that I think can tell us a lot about where we go and what we do, even if we're the ones that hurts someone else. Um, because the story about Joseph requires us to make a choice. And it's an important choice to that end. We're going to start in Genesis 37, verses 2 through 4 that are on the screen right here. I invite you to, to read along. If you happen to have a Bible that you like to read, uh, we're going to be starting in Genesis. It's the first chapter of the Bible. Uh, 37 there is there towards the middle. And um, as we read, just look carefully at how the relationship between Joseph and his older brothers develops in, this, in just these two verses of Scripture. All right? Check it out. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Oh, Joseph. Now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, <clears throat> they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So imagine this if you can. This is, this is a big family that we're being introduced to in the Bible. I mean, it's, it's Jacob's family. He has several sons. But it's his youngest son, Joseph, that earns his favor. And it's illustrated lavishly through this coat of many colors that he has made for him. It was so bright and so colorful. You could see Joseph coming from a long distance. He wore it every single day. It was so bright. It was so unique. And it was a tremendous gift from a proud father. It also represented, however, something that would sow the seeds of resentment carried by Joseph's older brothers. It turns out that Joseph had many other gifts as well. Later in the text, we read of these detailed dreams that he would have. This, this young boy of 17 sees what he thinks is in the future, these illustrations of his older brothers and even his father bowing down to him. These, these must have been just really confusing. But as Joseph shares these visions with his brothers, they're naturally annoyed and incensed at this idea that this young kid with an expensive coat could ever lord authority over them. And while all of this, the dreams and the new coat burned in his brothers' hearts, Joseph had something else that they perceived that they would never, ever have. And that was their father's favor in their minds at that time, no matter what they did, no matter how hard they worked, they would never be as loved as much as Joseph was. And that made them really, really angry. So when we read in the text here in verse 4 that, that they said they hated him and they could not speak a kind word to him, we might actually hit the pause button for a second and say, okay, really? Could they really not speak a kind word to him? He was just a kid. Hmm. But I'd invite you to think about that for a second. Because here's what we see in this story about Joseph's brothers. Um, they didn't like what he wore. They didn't like what he said. And they didn't like what he represented. And if we, if we pause for just a moment and try to get into the mind for just an, or even just to understand the story of Joseph's brothers for, for just a moment, we, 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 can probably, we can probably recognize what that felt like. And as I was thinking about the story, I think the, the modern corollary that just sort of jumped off the page to me and it began to really uh, kind of punch holes in my heart just a little bit is to think about Oh gosh, I can't even quantify how much ink and bandwidth and personal energy has been spent and likely wasted over the last year and a half or more about people worrying about what people wear, particularly on their faces. I've seen people, self-included, 
turn all kinds of shades of red based on something they heard someone say or something that they read that somebody typed on social media. And if we think really carefully, we can probably think of an example in our family or somebody else's where someone has, well, they're just not part of our family anymore because of something they believe or represent. In that context, we can certainly see where Joseph's brothers were coming from. They didn't like what he wore. They didn't like what he said. And they didn't like what he represented. So they plotted to kill him. Or they hesitated, really. Instead, they, they sold him into slavery. And if you're familiar with the story, you know that uh, Joseph, as he approached them, they overtook him. And they stripped him of his coat and they threw him in a pit and they sold him for 20 pieces of silver to a band of Ishmaelites traveling to Egypt. To cover up what they'd done, they slaughtered a pig and covered Joseph's coat in blood so they could present it to Jacob, their father, and tell him some story about Joseph being killed by a wild animal. Now, we have some clues, but I'll leave it up to you to decide what actually motivated Joseph's brothers to, to go through with this pretty elaborate plan to go to such lengths to rid themselves of their younger brother. Perhaps they were mad with rage or fueled by unbridled jealousy. Remember, hurt people hurt people. Whatever their driving emotion whatever internal condition they were dealing with at the time, we know for sure they were not operating out of a sense of love. What is love? <laughs> well, the text that was read earlier, written by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church, outlines for us the very character of what love is, also by describing what love is not. You see, this new church that, that Paul was writing to, the Corinthians, well, just like every other church in the history of the world, they had their own disagreements and problems to sort out. But by, delivering, by, by deliberately describing, I should say, what love is, Paul also describes the deep value that love adds in the pursuit of Christian discipleship. If you roll back the tape just a couple of verses in 1 Corinthians 13, you get a sense of how Paul is framing this for the larger church. He says in verse one, if I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only resounding a gong or clanging a cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. So let's clarify this for a moment. You see, Paul's preaching a message of love to the Corinthian church, a message of unity. They, they are called to be in unity together as they pursue the love of Christ. And maybe there are people in the Corinthian community right now that are practicing these disciplines that he outlines in the first couple of verses of this 13th chapter, but maybe they're doing it for ulterior motives. Maybe they're speaking in tongues to draw attention to themselves. Maybe they're, maybe they're boastfully giving everything that they have to the poor so that people will think highly of them. When in fact, as he points out, everything that we do, everything that we do in pursuit of Christ is love for God and love for one another. That's it. That's it. So it begs the question, and I'm sure they were asking themselves as they were reading this part of Paul's letter, what is love? And we had it read before, and I'd love to just reread it again. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love 
never fails. You know, as I, <laughs> as I read that passage of scripture with Genesis 37 still in my mind, and I'm thinking, here I am, one of Joseph's brothers, every single line of 1 Corinthians 13 just kind of hits harder than the one before it. Love is patient. Love is kind. Were Joseph's brothers patient and kind? <laughs> Not really, were they? Not at all. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe at first they could possibly understand where Joseph was coming from, but the more and more they heard about these dreams of them bowing down to him, their patience began to run thin. Instead, Joseph's brothers were envious and they were prideful. They were short-tempered and easily angered. Try as they might, they couldn't help but keep a growing list of everything that they despised about their brother instead of unifying on the familial love that they shared. At the very least, they had the same father. And they could have protected one another. But instead, they chose to run towards the things that separated them instead of the things that unified them. We're living in a time where so many among us are quick to anger and slow to love. It's our reactionary culture that is tearing communities and families apart. And far too often, I think we're falling out of love instead of towards what love is. If we're to be unified, if we are seeking the unity that God has called us towards, we have to choose to lead with love. It really is a choice. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. And love always perseveres. As followers of Christ, we must choose love and we must lead with love too. Even in times of chaos and uncertainty, love must be our default. For if we do not lead with love, if we lead with pride, boasting, anger, fear, and self-centeredness, what does that say about our witness to Christ and how he has so awesomely transformed all of us who proclaim to know him as our Savior? Jesus wasn't any of those things that I just mentioned. He was the antithesis of self-centeredness. When he willingly died on a cross so that you and I could live free from the wages of sin and brokenness, Jesus' example is clear. There are no records of the wrongs that you and I have committed. There's no list of all of our offenses or the times that we've yelled at our grandmas. <laughs> Because love never fails. So I have a picture that I'd like to show you here. Um, this is a picture of a man that we know of only as Mr. Lee. Okay. Mr. Lee worked in a factory near his home in China when he was much younger. And one day he was approached by an older man who gave him a sword. And he gave other implements to the people that he was working with that day. Here's a closer picture of it. And this older man told Mr. Lee and his cohorts a very simple set of directions. Go into your village and kill anyone who is not from your country. You see, at that time, there were a number of Christian missionaries from all over the world, some from the United States. And they were sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ widely. And people were coming to know the amazing grace and peace and freedom that comes with knowing Jesus' name and accepting him as a savior of all sins. There were people in, the, in China at that time that didn't like what these new Christians looked like. They didn't like what they wore. They certainly didn't like what they said and they didn't like what they represented. And so in 1900, of what would later become known as the Boxer Rebellion, several missionaries from around the world would perish. By his own count, Mr. Lee killed seven Christian missionaries. 
20 years later, so around in the 1920s, missionaries started to return to China. Some from even right here in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. They returned to share the gospel message with the Chinese people. Although the Boxer Rebellion was still probably very present in their memory and in their mind, they returned out of a sense of duty, a sense of calling, a sense of love for people that, that may have never heard the name of Jesus. One of those missionaries was Henry Oberholzer. I hope I'm saying his name right. He um, heard Mr. Lee's story. Mr. Lee would have been a, an older man at this point. And it turns out that Mr. Lee still had that sword that he was given several years ago. And he was haunted by it. You see, Mr. Lee had come to know the name of Jesus and to know the redeeming grace that comes through accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he no longer had any need for his sword. So he gave it to Mr. Oberholzer, who brought it back to Pennsylvania and donated it to Elizabethtown College, which would have been uh, connected to his church at the time. And the sword is still housed in the Hess Archives and High Library. I've seen it with my own eyes, and it is chilling to think about what this sword was used for over 120 years ago during the Boxer Rebellion. Now, as an implement of war, it's not a very good represent representation these days. As you can see from that black and white photo, you can see clearly that it is not in very good shape. Pitted by rust and rot. It's not as effective as it would have been in 1900. But to many who hear this story and see these pictures, this relic is a reminder. And it is a glorious reminder that the love of Jesus Christ can invade even the darkest places and bring unity and unification once again. Just at the sound of Jesus' name, love never fails. Well, several years after Joseph is sold into slavery, Famine breaks out in the land where Jacob and his sons live. Desperate, they decide to try to travel to Egypt and plead with the king there to see if he would be merciful to them and to share some provision so that they could survive the famine. They'd long forgot about Joseph. But you can imagine how Joseph felt when he saw them approaching him, now acting as the king of Egypt, running the kingdom for the king himself. And there were his brothers bowing before him, praying that he would be merciful to them and help them. If you know the story, you also know that Joseph goes through a serious period of reflection. He's immediately taken back to the time when he was 17 and, and scared as he was thrown into a pit and then sold into slavery just to rise again and fall again, to rise again and fall again, all at the hands of his brothers. And he had every right as the king of Egypt and every right for what had been done to him to crush his brothers where they stand. But instead... He chose love. Ultimately, this family, broken by rage and envy and anger, was reunited. You see, love never fails. In each of these cases that we've looked at today, whether it was um, Joseph, Mr. Lee, or uh, an impatient 20-year-old, each made a purposeful choice. They didn't want to be hurt. And they certainly didn't want to hurt others. Vengeful and reactive people they may have once were, they were trying to choose a different path and to be that way no longer. You see, moving beyond hurt, friends, starts with a choice to lead with love. And that choice can happen today. Not the next time chaos breaks loose we find ourselves in another pandemic, but today. 
See, the same love that united this family, the same love that transformed Mr. Lee, the same love that keeps no records of wrongs or discriminates against you based on your politics, your postal code, or your social position. That love, that love that fosters life and brings feuding factions to a halt is the same love that can flood this place from top to bottom. It can invade your heart and it can transform you today. It can bring back what was once divided, mend what was torn apart, and bring to life that which was once thought dead. <laughs> this is the love, friends. The love that I'm talking about, this is the love that took on the sin of the world, died on a cross, and came back to life so that we would know that we can live free from our sins. This is a love that never fails and it will never fail you. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Well, gracious God, we thank you for inviting us to your table to hear the stories that you tell. Lord, to share our hearts with you before we even open our mouths to pray, Lord, you know the words that we're about to say. Heavenly Father, we know that even in times of confusion that you are present. And I pray now a special prayer, Lord, for those who might be in amb ambiguity, who might not have a compass, Lord, a direction to move. Lord, I pray that you clear the path make a resounding call in their lives. Help them take that first step forward beyond hurt. Lord, let your love invade this place as it has invaded the hearts of so many as we join the chorus of believers for generations saying hallelujah for new life has risen today. love you, Lord. Amen and amen. Well, thank you for joining us for this online worship service today. We hope that the message has meant something to you. If you've enjoyed this message and would like to share it with someone else, we hope that you'll use the share link right below this video uh, to send it to as many people as you can. We hope that this message is spread far and wide as we learn together what it means to move beyond hurt. God is doing an amazing thing in your life wherever you're hearing this today. Know that when we choose love, we're choosing Him. And love never fails. May the grace and peace that surpasses all understanding be with you today and until we meet again. Amen, friends. <laughs>